The written word has been the foundation of our society ever since it was invented. But for most of human history, the only people who could write things down were professional scribes or people who could afford to pay them. This was not very many people, so most of humanity's ideas went unrecorded. Then came the printing press and widespread literacy. All of a sudden, anyone could write down their thoughts, and it was much easier for them to spread. This led to revolutions in everything. Uh, governments, business, learning, culture, everything changed. We're in a similar situation today. The foundation of our society now is technology, and the only ones who can shape technology are professional programmers, or people who can afford to pay them. This is not very many people, so most of humanity's ideas go unbuilt. But I have good news. Recently, I've discovered that the tools have gotten good enough that anyone can learn to code. And I believe that everyone should learn to code because when more of us begin to see our technology as builders and not just consumers, I think we're going to see a whole new set of revolutions. So let me tell you a bit about why I came to believe both of these things. So I've always been an ideas guy. I've spent a lot of time scrawling things down on the back of napkins. But I was lucky enough to get the chance to try and execute on some of my ideas. When I was about 21, I dropped out of Indiana and I went to India to start up some ventures. Now, why India? Well, it's a long story, but I was 21. And I thought I had it all figured out. But uh, it turns out I had nothing at all figured out. And I knew nothing about India, startups, or life in general. But Slowly, very slowly, I learned a little bit about each of these things, and eventually I reached a crossroads. I did decide between continuing to grow the business or exiting, and I chose to exit because at heart, I'm a huge nerd. Uh, I love to learn, so of course I dropped back into college here at UChicago, and uh, one of the things I was most excited to learn was how to program, because the story of my life as an entrepreneur was one of being constantly frustrated by my inability to code. To build the simplest prototypes, you had to attract a developer, you had to forward them, you had to communicate your vision to them, and something usually got lost in translation. So I took a couple of comp site classes as soon as I got here, and they were interesting, they were challenging, but um, I didn't come away with anything that I could apply immediately to any of my ventures. Uh, it was all very theoretical, it felt like I'd have to do a couple more years of groundwork before I got to the practical applications, which was discouraging. And, um, and then there were my classmates, the computer science majors. They were very smart. They used bigger words than I knew. <laughs> and, you know, generally just very intimidating. So I thought maybe uh, programming is best left to the professionals after all, and I kind of gave up. But then last fall, I heard about a school here in downtown Chicago. Uh, they claim to be able to take complete beginners and teach them how to build fully functional web apps in 11 weeks. Now, I was skeptical of this, but I was desperate. I wanted it to be true. So I gave it a shot, and I'm happy to say that it worked. Uh, Code Academy, they showed me just the right tools to use as a beginner and just enough of how to use them so that I got productive in just a matter of weeks. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on, this guy's not really a complete beginner. He took some comp sci classes. Um, he had a technical background, and that's fair. But um, let me tell you about my friend Tom. Tom was one of my classmates at Code Academy. Uh, he came in truly as a beginner. Um, he didn't know anything about programming. He wasn't even the best at using a computer, so we were a little bit worried about Tom. Um, but he had an, an idea that he was passionate about building. He wanted to make a real estate search engine that lets you find homes based on their distance to public transit, which I think is a great idea. So the very first week, uh, our instructor gave us a basic exercise. We were supposed to model a bank account. Tom and I were partnering up and I was getting ready to make this bank account, and Tom said, well, hang on, can we model a real estate listing instead? 
And I was like, mm -hmm, yeah, I guess. I mean, I was used to doing theoretical kind of exercises and not thinking about applications until way down the road. But Tom, no matter how little he knew, he wanted to start building a solution to the problem he was passionate about solving on day one. So I might have come in knowing more than Tom on day one, but by day two, as far as building real solutions to real problems, Tom had already left me behind. So he continued to do this. Every day we'd learn a little bit, and every night he'd go home and plug in that bit to his app idea. And at the end of the program, he had built this. This is Live by Transit. I've showed it, I've asked it here to show me homes within five minutes walking of a metro stop. And you can see the results neatly trace out the metro lines. Um, you can do the standard real estate filters and sorts. He figured out how to make this map dynamic, so as you pan and zoom, it updates the search results. And he even figured out how to tie in Chicago Public Schools data so that you can rank and filter your results by school district. So this is a sophisticated, powerful, useful site, and it was built by a guy who had never seen a line of code just three months before. So given the right instruction, the right community, it is possible with passion and persistence for beginners to learn how to build meaningful apps. The tools that enable this for beginners have just recently come into being and they're just getting better all the time. So, all right, maybe anyone can learn to code, but why should they? Let me tell you a couple reasons why I believe they should. There's been a lot of ink spilled lately over the jobless recovery, so basically, the stock market's back to where it was before the recession. Uh, corporate profits are at record levels, but the jobs haven't come back. And a lot of people think this is because technology has gotten so good that the remaining employees have become so efficient, they just do all the work that there is to be done. And that uh, we're just going to see a continually rising trend of systemic unemployment uh, as technology gets better, especially as artificial intelligence technology matures. So that's scary, but uh, I read a book lately called Race Against the Machine. In it, authors, the authors describe events in the world of chess, which is a classic area of application of AI. So, in 1997, for the first time ever, a computer beat the best human chess player in the world. This was big news at the time, but uh, it's kind of become old hat since then, and nobody talks about computers beating humans anymore. The action shifted into AI versus AI to see who the best in the world at chess is. But today, the best chess playing entity in the world is neither a human grandmaster nor an AI. It's a team of humans and computers. The humans aren't grandmasters. They're actually amateur chess players. But they're very skilled at coaching the computers at which moves to look deeply into. And there's something about that synergy that a pure AI hasn't been able to replicate. And the authors observed this pattern in industry after industry where teams of computers and humans defeat the best AI and the best human experts. So to me, this is a hopeful takeaway. It tells me that we are still gonna be useful, but that uh, the ability to communicate with our machines or to program is gonna be fundamental in the 21st century economy. Now, I am not saying that everybody has to be an engineer. Exactly the opposite. I don't think everybody has to be a professional author to create value by writing. And you don't have to be a pro photographer to create value by taking pictures. I took up photography a couple of years ago. I read somewhere that the mere act of carrying a camera with you, even if you never take any pictures, changes the way that you look at the world. Um, when you're always looking for a shot, you take less for granted, you notice more things, and you're just generally more engaged with the world around you. Now, I noticed a similar phenomenon after I learned to code. Uh, I wasn't expecting this, it was a surprise to me, but before, if I ever noticed a little annoyance or irritation in my day-to-day -day life, I would just be annoyed for a couple minutes and then I would forget about it and move on. But now I look at things with a builder's eye, and if I notice one of these pain points, I analyze it, I search for existing solutions, and if there aren't any, I make one. So one of my favorite things to do is take long road trips on my motorcycle, and one of the best things about road trips is stopping at all these nice little local gems you find along the way. 
coffee shops or restaurants, local attractions. So I was worried that I was missing out on a lot of great stuff that might have been just a little bit out of my way, and I wanted to be able to search along my whole route before I left home. I couldn't find a way, so I made this. You give it your origin and your destination, it goes to Google Maps and figures out your route, and then it goes to Yelp, and it searches along that route, finds the best spots, and shows them to you. So I made that before Thanksgiving break, and I used it on my way home. I gave it to some of my friends. They used it to plan some road trips, and it added just a little bit of value to our lives. Another one of my pain points, I get a bunch of fun-sounding Groupons in the mail all the time, but I don't want to go by myself. I want at least three of my buddies to come with me. Now, at least with my friends, trying to get everybody coordinated over email, figure out a date, figure out who's in, never happens before the Groupon expires. <laughs> so we miss out on a lot of cool stuff. So I made this. Uh, it pulls in your city's Groupons. If you find something you like, you're a click away from inviting your Facebook friends. They all get a notification. And when, say, three of them commit, the deal tips. Everybody gets a text message. It makes a Facebook event, puts it in your calendar. So I made this tool, and we've been using it. And because of it, we've all gone out together a few more times than we would have otherwise. And to me, that's very valuable. So. If it were up to me, the university would make a course on building web apps part of the core curriculum. And it would count towards the art requirement, because it all feels the same to me. The first time you make one of your ideas real, and you push it out live on the web, and, and you see it, and people are using it, and you built it with your own hands, uh, you feel like this. <laughs> and uh, the ability to make your ideas real is a superpower. Could you imagine what the students here would build if they all had this ability? <laughs> what would the literature majors build? Or the public policy majors? What would the athletes build? Or the dancers? What would you build? So far, the only pain points that get addressed are the ones experienced by professional developers or people who can afford to pay them. This is not very many people. so. Most of humanity's ideas go unbuilt. What happens when people from all walks of life gain the ability to make their ideas real based on what they observe in their unique experience? When you give experts from other fields the ability to code, they become dangerous. And I think that this is going to lead to a whole new set of revolutions. I can't wait. So this brings me to another crossroads. It looks like I might actually finally graduate from college. Uh, so the question is, what do I do next? So I could return to the world of business, where there are still many opportunities, especially now that I can code. But I'm also happy to say that I was accepted to some of my top choice grad schools, and that's been a lifelong dream of mine. So I've decided to do neither. After I learned how to code in the fall, uh, I was invited to be a teaching assistant for the winter class. And it turns out that the only thing I love more than building my ideas is helping other people learn how to build theirs. So after I graduate, I'm going to be dedicating myself full time to teaching beginners how to code and uh, doing everything in my power to usher in the coding revolution. Thank you. So after hearing Raghu speak at the student speaker competition, we were so inspired that we wanted to find a way to incorporate a little bit of what he was so passionate about into our event. About a week ago, the student group Hack, uh, UChicago Hack hosted a hackathon. After about 30 hours of pitching ideas, building their teams, consuming lots of pizza and coffee, um, and building some really cool apps. Uh, one of the student winners ended up being none other than our speaker, Ragu Bethana. Promise there's no conspiracy. Um, and so today, we're very happy to introduce Paul Rosenswag and his partner in crime, Ragu Bethana, who will be sharing with you their winning app.
Hi. <laughs> so, we were supposed to do a live demo, which is nerve wracking. We're going to hope that the Wi Fi in here doesn't come to its knees. But if you happen to have a laptop, you can go to questionstream.in slash TEDx, and you can ask us any questions that you might have for us about the hackathon or what we've built. Uh, you can try on your smartphone, but we make no promises. While we do that, let me uh, tell a little story, I guess. Um, so six months ago, I was a lurker. I, I wanted to be a developer, so I kind of hung out at all these technical events, the hackathons and the tech talks, and I didn't say much, and I hope nobody would notice that I didn't belong. Um, last year, I actually worked up the courage to join a programming tournament that they had on campus. The format was five hours, and it was a race to solve programming puzzles. So I joined, and I managed to come in last <laughs> with an impressive score of zero. <laughs> um, not easy to spend five up zero points, but I pulled it off. <laughs> but then fast forward to the hackathon last week, and uh, you know I can now participate and hold my own with the help of a rock star like Paul. I can actually win. So I had already written my whole TED talk about how anybody can learn to code, and it didn't actually even sink in for me that I actually can build stuff now. I'm not outside looking in anymore until the hackathon. So I wanted to thank our teacher, Jeff Cohen, an amazing teacher, uh, for making that dream come true. So thanks, Jeff. All right, so we haven't gone live yet, but technical difficulties. I'm not very good with computers. But so this is supposed to be a live stream of us speaking on the right. And on the left, we have uh, a panel of questions where students can type in questions and they come down live. They instantly propagate out to all the other students in the room. And you can click on a question to vote. And the hotter questions turn redder and redder so that the instructor has kind of a heat map of what people are getting confused about when. So that's the basic idea. Let's see what some of the questions are. Why, why did you build this? Why do we build this? We'll do, so we think that remote education has the potential to change the world, but that nobody has quite yet figured it out. Uh, one of the shortcomings we see with existing solutions is the questions. We think 90% of learning happens around questions. And most of the existing solutions have either no interaction at all between student and teacher, or very chaotic interactions. So we wanted to build a way where it's very easy to encourage, organize, and prioritize questions. Uh, what were some of the technical challenges, Paul? So in building this, we wanted it to just work. We wanted students to come and immediately be able to just ask questions, vote up their classmates' questions. We wanted the teacher not to have to read how many people had this question, but just to sort of get a feel for which questions were, were getting hot, were, were burning in their students' minds. So making this so real-time and snappy and, and easy to use, trying to make it easy for the end user was actually quite complex on our end and had a, a bunch of technical challenges. How long did it take? How long did it take? So this was part of last weekend's hackathon. Let me see if I can make a new tab. Um, we have a graph for how long it took. Yes, we're nerds. <laughs> we have killed the Wi-Fi, I think. Yeah, we did. All right, just wing it. OK. <laughs> So we built this over 30 hours. And we used this tool called Git that would allow us to track and collaborate um, with all of our code. 
And so we had this nice graph that would show over the 30 hours the, the code, amount of code we had steadily going up. Each time we incorporate a new open source library, there it is, there it is we'd see a little spike because we're, we're pulling in all this community code. And then in the, the last few hours, you can see the, the git panic as, as we were just constantly coding, trying to get ready for judging at, at 6 p.m. on Sunday. In the middle, you can see we weren't getting too much sleep. There's us writing code at 6 in the morning, 3 in the morning. So, so that's how we wrote it. Education, the only application. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing Welcome fine, thank Ted. you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you for asking. Uh, so, uh, education, the only application. No, so we, so we observed this pain point. We, we're both students and we're both teachers, so we observed the pain point from that perspective, but we think that this platform could be useful anywhere where questions are an important part of the dialogue. So, earnings calls, press conferences, interviews, uh, campaign debates, they could all, you know, take advantage of being able to organize a large number of questions from a large audience. Monetization. There's always an entrepreneur in the crowd. How do you monetize? <laughs> um, we don't know. Yet. We don't know yet. All right. So we're running short on time, but we had one more thing. Uh, could you flip back over to the graph? So we were, we, yeah, at around, so you see we kind of started to coast in the middle there. And that was because we basically had built out what you've already seen, and we were just playing with it and admiring it. But then we realized that that data of what questions were getting asked and when was actually very valuable. So we wanted to capture that some way. So we actually built a feature where after the class is over, the teacher can go back to the classroom and replay the question stream along with the video to see where and when people are getting confused about things, maybe to fine tune their lecture. Maybe students can go back afterwards, even if they weren't able to make it to the first class, watch the recording, but also get that sense of community by seeing the questions that other students were asking real time. So we built that. That's that last minute kind of panic over there. So we're trying to get that work before the judging. So yeah, so that's what we built. Um, one last thing, we were really excited to get a chance to present to this room in particular because this is a room full of students, teachers, and people with ideas. So if you have any feedback at all on how we can make this tool more useful, please uh, send us an email at founders at questionstream.in. Thank you. <laughs>